Um, thank you so much for joining us for this afternoon session. I, I think it's going to be a really wonderful event. I'll just introduce myself. My name is Lee Schwamm. I am the Chief Digital Health Officer for the Yonah Haven Health System and School of Medicine. I'm also a professor of neurology and bioinformatics and data sciences, and I'm the Associate Dean for Digital Strategy and Transformation at the School of Medicine. And I'm really excited about this panel, and I think all of you in the audience will learn some really interesting and important things about trends in where healthcare investing is going, and maybe some of the secret sauce for how to appeal to these people over here on the left when you're trying to think about the next stage for your company. So um, we have a really distinguished group of panelists, and I'm going to ask them each to uh, introduce themselves by way of a, of a little bit of an anecdote. Uh, we have just seated for me here, left to right, we have Gay Bach, who is the general partner at the Mass General Brigham AI Digital Innovation Fund. We have Josh Flum, who's a managing partner at LRV Health. We have Annie Lamont, who's the founding partner of Oak HCFT. And we have Brenton Farnioli, who's general partner at Alicorp. And I'm going to ask you each, we'll go down the row here. You could have done anything in your life, Gay. You could have been an astrophysicist or, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, a teacher, whatever you chose, healthcare investing. Give us just a minute or two as to why healthcare investing as a career. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lee. Um, and thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I run an AI digital innovation venture fund at Mass General Brigham. I think that um, I was fortunate enough to get exposed to technology and try and get um, inventions out of the lab and into the marketplace early in my career. And I think that we've been blessed to live in an incredible time of technological change, not just in IT, but also in biology. So I'm doing this because I think it's the way I can have a big impact on people's lives and try and make life better. I'm not a doc and I don't have the biological sciences background. So that's why I'm doing it. Wonderful. Josh? Yeah. So uh, I, my, uh, I had an interesting journey, I think, into healthcare investing. I'm going to, this will upset my mother, by the way, but I'm going to start my life here. Um, I uh, went to law school actually here, graduated uh, law school and went off into uh, clerking and white collar criminal defense and that pathway, but became really interested in business for a variety of reasons, went to BCG and that took me into CVS. And at CVS, I had the good fortune of really working a lot on pharmacy back in 2001 in the early days and just really got enamored by the power of that kind of consumer driven model, that access model, what the power of that community based healthcare really could become, as well as the intricacies and complexities of product and payment within that world. And that took me through a journey ultimately of leading our pharmacy business for many years and then running strategy. And 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 that took me into really being enamored. We started our venture fund at this intersection of incumbents. Um, and entrepreneurs? And how do those groups that really misunderstand each other find ways to work better together to really deliver meaningful change? And and that's what really brought me deeper onto the investing side and ultimately onto a platform like LRV, which is invested in by strategics, including Yale. So that's sort of the serendipity of my journey. Thank you, Counselor. Annie? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, how, how do I shorten this? Um, so long history. Um, so I, I, when I got out of Stanford, uh, not, not a rival, but a similar <laughs> kind of university, um, I, but it was it was just the the beginning of uh, Silicon Valley, and uh, actually it was the year that Genentech was founded, uh, as well as I mean Apple had been around two years, um, and and he worked for an investment bank, venture capital firm, um, and the first three months I was there, we took Apple public and Genentech public, and um, being associated with those two entrepreneurs, I decided that all I wanted to do in my life was be around fascinating people who were changing the world like they were. Um, so I got into venture capital um, and joined a, strangely joined a firm in Westport, Connecticut, because it was the one place I could find a VC job. Mm. Um, and we founded Genzyme the first year that I was there. Uh, and so I got exposed to biotech and invested in biotech for 15 years. And then in 1999, with the advent of the internet, um, decided that 
uh, when it was not, it were 4,000 public biotech companies and five approved drugs. And so people then realized that biologicals were not sort of an automatic way to, you know, a drug working. Um, and I knew it was going to be not a great decade and looked around and I'd actually had to drop out of Stanford my junior year because my dad got sick. He didn't have healthcare insurance. Um, and it was quite a journey sort of finding my way back to Stanford my senior year and figuring out how to pay for it. Um, and so I did just, look at healthcare and say, you know what, I want to be about fixing the system. And in 2000, decided to start working in um, software and services with a focus and just a mission of how do you lower costs and improve care in healthcare. And um, it's really been my passion and mission ever since. Well, I guess we cannot say you don't know how to pick a winner there. Uh, Apple, Genentech, Genzyme, that's, that's quite a nice early streak to start with. Brent? Hi, yeah. So I'm a physician. And so was on the front lines of Brigham and Women's Memorial Sloan Kettering, and our goal was to provide, you know, the standard of care. And it was pretty eye-opening that the standard of care delivery is pretty antiquated, and so uh, really felt compelled to try and be on the innovation side and creating new standards of care. And around that time, I joined a early stage startup called Flatiron Health. I was there for about five years. We were taking uh, oncology data, trying to make it useful. An incredible run uh, there, and that really kind of catapulted me into the startup uh, and venture ecosystem and joined Alicorp about five years ago to start the healthcare practice uh, alongside Kevin Ryan, who's uh, a big Yaley, uh, and so really uh, grateful and excited to be, be here today. Wonderful. And just for the audience's benefit, um, when we talked about this before the session, so Josh and Brent are really focused on early stage and Gay only invests in companies that have a product that the healthcare system can consume. And Annie, we, we decided you were more in the growth phase of things, but it sounds like you've also extending back now to early stage as well. Is that right? We do everything from, yeah, startup to late. Great. Awesome. Well, it's been certainly a challenging year. If you're a, a, a digital health entrepreneur and you wanted investment, it's been a challenging year or two. And it seems like the goalposts have moved a little bit in terms of expectations from the public and private markets and what a, a would-be company has to bring forward in order to attract attention or to attract capital. And there's been, I think, more of an emphasis on demonstrating efficacy. And we'll talk a little bit about what does that have to look like to convince you that there's actually a there there. Um, and we can't talk about this without mentioning that 40% of the funding in quarter one went to companies that said something about AI in their product. Um, and we have to think about, you know, what does that really mean? It's anything from, I have a software front end that I slapped onto a publicly available open source large language model to, no, I have a foundation model that I built myself. So we want to kind of understand what does a company have to do to explain if they are infusing AI in their product in a genuine way explainability about how they're how they're using it. So we're going to start with the first question, which is really around what what is meant by strong outcomes or efficacy? What is that what is that bar that early stage companies in healthcare need to start trying to meet? And what makes an opportunity stand out to you? So we'll, maybe we'll go the other direction first, Brent, and I'll ask you and then anyone feel free to jump in. Sure. So the stage we're operating at, we'll often start the company and incubate it ourselves or very first investor. So oftentimes there isn't a customer yet. There might not even be a line of code written. Um, and so we're really fixated on the founding team. What are their capabilities? How do those directly apply to the market they're trying to solve? And is that a market that's growing rapidly underserved uh, and important to attack? And so that's uh, the general construct. And then, um, you know, in terms of efficacy, we take a very um, important look at the clinical lens of it. I think half of our team have a physician background. And so we're always looking at what is the existing evidence base, whether it's care model innovation um, that we could apply to uh, the future build and growth of this, of this uh, company. Others? So there, I mean, there's so many ways to look at this. We we think about it in as different customer sets. So you're either you're either a provider that in most cases is we're looking at providers. We think about providers that are value based oriented. So taking risk, you know, or it's a technology enabled service to a payer, an employer, um, 
and not a consumer um, and uh, or say why, say why not I mean you threw that as an pharma. aside but why not a consumer why not direct because consumer? consumers don't pay in healthcare right I mean it's just fundamental and I think there were certainly a lot of the last I would say six seven years I mean the fantastic thing in the last decade is that young smart tech focused entrepreneurs have actually gotten into healthcare that was, if you looked at investing from 2000 to 2012, that, that didn't really happen. I mean, we originally backed Athena. That was very unusual. So I would say that what's great is that so many young people are now in second and third generations of companies from coming from Flatiron or Oscar or other companies that have now learned. But like the first question we ask is who pays and why? Because I think it's just it's so fundamental to how you think about like the needed product or service, um, and it's either going to be you know will you either invest in things that are about efficiency, although if you're selling to a hospital, it better be about revenue and efficiency, uh, or it's going to be something that's uh, value based and in, in orientation in general, unless you're in the pharma services side. Yeah, I think um, I agree. We start with uh, from a health system perspective. Well, we're we, we have two funds. One fund invests uh, generally as the first round of investment in companies spinning out of research done at Mass General Brigham. Um, I'm the partner on the other fund. We invest in companies where the health system is a customer. So, looking at it from an ROI perspective, um, who in the health system is going to be the the champion and the stakeholder and has the budget to pay for it, and then can we extrapolate from that health system to other health systems? We also are, have a health plan and are growing a health plan, growing our health plan. So we're looking at things that are payer focused as well. I'd say the big change in the last two years is from just growth at any cost to looking for things that are going to really uh, have a pathway to EBITDA positive and um, can think about the the business model that makes sense for the segment that they're selling into. Um, I think that's really important. And then team, and do they understand workflow? Uh, yeah. And the, the only thing, Lee, that I, I you, it's always hard going last, so you don't, you add something, but I would say, uh, right, everybody would say, and I totally agree with the team. And I think people have said in venture that, you know, the team you build is a company you build. And I think that is true in many ways. So it's that we're very, cause we're earlier often, we're very thematically driven. So we're like, where in the market, maybe we'll cover this later. What themes like, where is the market going in five, 10 years, right? Versus today. And then the other is the problem that's being solved. And I guess the way I, kind of think about that a lot of times is healthcare has a lot of problems. Um, but there are a lot of problems that when they're solved still won't be sustainable business models. So you're looking for a problem that needs to be solved that will be and create a sustainable business model. And I think that part of it is often the hardest part of the equation in healthcare, because as Annie said, you have to fit into workflows and you have to fit into payment models. And, you know, you're looking at where the puck is going, but you're also looking at fitting into this complicated system. And so, uh, that comes a lot into play in how we evaluate a company. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges is trying to find the fit between the problems that healthcare really needs to tackle and the things that will make the most difference to patients and their outcomes versus a sustainable funding model that tends to prioritize health system dollars, at least around efficiencies, better revenue capture, lowering costs of delivering, you know, cost per unit care. And so it can be a little discouraging sometimes because some of the most idealistic goals that we might have are really, really hard to create sustainable funding mechanisms for. Um, you know, I think um, we're just talking about this concept of for health systems and really thinking about value. And one of the challenges that we face in our own institution, I certainly in my role, um, my, my uh, dyad partner, who's the CIO of the system and I, we're constantly being pitched point solutions that are verticals. I can figure out the UTI in the emergency department and avoid the admission. I can figure out how to turn your conversation into a note that can go in the chart. I can uh, automatically code your billing. I can, but we're not getting a lot of horizontals. And we have Epic, of course, as the giant example of the, you know, the, 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 the child, killer, the child it. eating monster <laughs> horizontal. Um, so talk a little bit about this as you're thinking about these companies, how, how uh, much of platform extensibility do they need to have for you to believe that they're going to, they're going to land and stick versus can they nail that one, that one vertical? And is that enough to make them a successful company? And how do they, for an early stage company, 
sit next to the epic monster without getting eaten by it, but actually maybe, you know, cre create a profitable relationship with them. So why don't we start with you, Gay? Sure. Well, I mean, I think from the health systems perspective, we've gone through a lot of uh, changes in the last three years. We have a much more centralized um, digital strategy as a health system. So our first question is, um, is the opportunity that's coming, being pitched to us, can it be met by one of the major partners of our architectural digital blueprint? And if the answer is yes, or we think they will in the next 12 months, then it's probably not a good fit. But then beyond that, we're looking at, um, you know, we also have point fatigue, um, a point solution fatigue as well. So we're looking for things that uh, can can address multiple indications. So you see that in particularly in care coordination or chronic care coordination, and and how many indications can you um, can you support. At what point do you combine those to go after and how do you best combine those? And I wouldn't say we have the answers, but I think that that's sort of an example of where you're looking at, um, at, at it, what makes sense to combine together from a clinical perspective and from an administrative perspective. And I'll just add very quickly, I think, you know, obviously what you'd love to find are things that are platforms and two-sided marketplaces, right, and have that accelerant. I think what's hard when you're early a lot of times, though, is it's really hard to just sell a platform sometimes versus selling something that solves a specific problem and can become a platform. So it's a little bit of a dance there uh, that you have to think through as you're looking at early stage investing. And then the other piece I think that is interesting and always on our mind, there are a lot of oligopies in healthcare, but there's probably none as big as Epic as we just talked about. And, and one thing to think about, you're always trying to ferret out is, is this a place where there'll be innovation for a time, but the platforms that really have the distribution and can link that into like other value add components may be able to win with a less perfect solution over time? Or is it something that's really sustainably differentiated, right? That can either fit onto those platforms or begin new platforms. And, and that's not an easy you know, question to answer, uh, you know, as you're looking at things early. I guess what I'd say is for us, it's selling into a healthcare system or a hospital system is the least attractive investment that we can think of. We're so quick. We're so <laughs> yeah, between Epic, between exactly. And every hospital like functions weirdly differently, right? Um, so it's a very, we were actually making our first investment in a long time in this area with a something that is backed by Gen AI, um, which we think will satisfy the needs of a, of a hospital system. But, I, you know, and I think that is the first inclination when an entrepreneur comes in, they're like, okay, I'm going to fix the hospital system or the healthcare system. And the reality is that's probably the last place you want to go um, because it is such a difficult uh, customer. Um, but I, so I do think it is back to sort of this business model question. And there is a reason that a lot of people went after Medicare Advantage because if you can think about innovative solutions around MA because you own a patient for eight years, you can actually take risk on them. You can char show ROI. You can, you can have impact. Now, CMS is is making that very difficult right now. So, you know, they're going to challenge those models. But, you know, if you think about it, and, and Josh and I are actually in something in Medicaid, people said there's no margin in Medicaid. Well, the reality is there's been very little innovation in Medicaid. That's the real issue. So the reality of this company is showing, you know, 10 and 15% kinds of reductions in costs with far improved care in the home. So I think there, are, you, you just have to think about where the neediest patients are, dual eligibles or something that isn't, you know, that is where much of the expenses and an area that is, you know, ripe with uh, opportunity. So I just think it's like thinking about your customer and different ways to go at them that actually work for the system. Uh, and it's not necessarily like we're just going to fix the hospital system because that's a, that is a very hard thing to do. Think about outside the hospital system. I love that Medicaid comment. I think there was a report that 20 times the investment has gone to Medicare Advantage than Medicaid. But as you might might know or might not know, there's more people on Medicaid than Medicare Advantage. So a uh, huge opportunity there. Also very complicated. So it's great that kind of healthcare-focused funds now are, are attacking that segment. On the um, point solution issue, we face this issue as investors as well. We're often saying, is this a feature? Is this a product? Or is this a company? And is this a venture-scale company? Um, and then similarly, since we're often at the ground floor, we can't do everything at once. We have to focus. And so there's a lot of thought around what's the right beachhead, what's the initial target. And then by solving that, do you unlock another layer uh, that 
you are now uniquely uh, situated to solve. Uh, and on the health system side, uh, we often like to focus at the really high priority areas where there is a lot of spend, whether it's clinical staffing. I know Max Laurent, co-founder at Nomad Health, is, is here today. Um, supply chain management, one of our companies, Clarium, has been working with, with Yale around that issue. And so there's some you know, big multi-billion dollar problems the health systems are grappling with often in antiquated ways. And so if you can create something that solves that problem in a holistic way, just supply chain or just clinician staffing. That's still a big, uh, big opportunity. So maybe I can ask you in the, in the light of this comments and this conversation, um, have you tell us a little story, maybe about two investments, one that you, you guessed right, maybe for the right or the wrong reason, but you guessed right. And you're really happy with where it's going. And one where you thought for all the world, like you were making a really smart choice and uh, didn't work out. Um, and maybe the latter is more common than the former, but just for the audience's sake, to sort of give an illustrative comparison. And, and you don't have to, you know, I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but you don't have to even say the name of the company if you don't want to. But tell us a little bit like, how good is the crystal ball, right? So you're, you've talked now about all the things you use as the lens through which to evaluate these companies. So what's it like to sit on your side of the of the uh, the money table and make those decisions? So what's so maybe start with you, Brenton. Like what's a what's an example of one where you you picked a winner early mm -hmm. and you and it and it won in the way you expected it to. Yep. And one where you thought it was really you know really pretty clear that it was going to be successful and just for whatever reason didn't make it and why? Sure. Um, I think the first one, you know. Since we're very early stage, we, we don't really know for even many more years if, if it's really worked, but um, at least looking at the crystal ball and where things are trending, uh, there's a company called Time Care in the oncology space. We're the very first investors there. Uh, back to the point around team, I think five of my direct reports from Flatiron and my first boss at Flatiron uh, are there. And so I had a really high confidence on the team going after this problem. And really what they're bringing is value-based uh, oncology care, which is a big growing area. And I think to date, a lot of it's been focused on utilization management, which is an important but singular component of the problem. Uh, and they, took a, they take a very provider-centric approach, partnering with primarily community oncologists. Uh, I think health systems often have a struggle with value-based care, whereas the community is uh, more willing to adopt. And so uh, very excited about the, the progress there uh, and still a lot, a lot to be done. Um, I think on the uh, didn't work outside, uh, it, things don't work out quicker than the things that do work. So we have a, a more certainty around that, that segment. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, one area we were very interested in, we actually wanted to incubate a company but we couldn't quite figure out how to crack it was the medical debt area, right? You know, number one cause of personal bankruptcy is healthcare costs. Um, really tragic situation, out of control. We found a company that um, was doing a good clip of revenue, had a product that was working well to help patients navigate their medical bills, thought the product worked really well. Um, to Annie's uh, wise wise statement on the consumer side, anything consumer oriented is challenging, right? And so they had more of a D to C motion. Uh, CACs were high. And so while they were still doing great work, um, that kind of CAC to LTV was very challenging. Um, and so I think a lesson there is, you know, going enterprise sooner uh, uh, and as, as quick as possible versus on the direct, direct consumer side there. So you knew there was, and that's still a problem, but still someone's going to solve it. We just haven't figured it out how to do it in a scalable fashion. Although we, th we think we actually had figured out how to do it on an individual level. So you knew that direct to consumer was choppy waters, but you thought this was, you know, this was an opportunity that might make its way through, but, but uh, unfortunately not. Yep. Annie. Um, so uh, two examples. So uh, CareBridge uh, is one example. Um, so Josh and I are in both investors in, and it, it's funny, we spent two years just mapping out different areas and figuring out, obviously, that went, wanted to go after Medicaid, ended up going after dual eligibles, um, LTSS, home-based care, essentially. So all virtual home-based care um, and figured out two, two things. One, you know, had a philosophy of when people want to stay, like people 
want to stay in their homes. And we certainly during, during COVID learned it's even safer to stay in your home than in a nursing home. And so, you know, all the movement by states to lower costs has been to keep people in their homes later in life. 90 plus percent of people want to be in their homes. So the idea was how do you support the, the sickest of the sick in their homes? And, you know, two things happened. One, um, they had a decision support, uh, uh, service initially, and it was figuring out like, if you're in your home, how do we empower you? Not how many hours should you, you know, we're going to try to give you as many hours as possible for a caregiver to take care of you. They actually came in uh, with a philosophy of like, how do we empower you to stay in your home and have as little help as possible? Because who wants to have people, you know, like, right in their home? So that was, I think, you know, kind of a unique twist on it and figuring out like, and not like, gee, how can we, for the payer, you know, figure out how to pay you the least? You know, it was how do we get the right level of care? And there was no standard for this, so there were people getting, you know, literally seven days a week, twenty four hours a day that absolutely didn't need it or want it. Um, and so they figured out through the right level of care and the right amount, you know, time. Um, so that was like the first product, and then they went into taking risk on these patients for. Uh, basically Medicaid HMOs. And so they would hand, hand over a patient. There's a certain amount that's paid, you know, for this patient a year. And then they would, through virtual support for to the caregiver, because most of these people are sick enough, they have a caregiver at some level in the home, you know, be it a family member or a paid person. Um, and they would provide, it's, it's just like this long-term, this longevity of experience. So of care coordination for this person in the home. And it was a godsend. It has like 87% NPS scores, you know, everybody loves it. Huge win for the payer, huge win for the families, the patients. It's just one of those, like it's the trifecta of win, win, win in healthcare, you know. And so, seven years after we started the company, years, you know, the company's going to do five billion in revenues then this year, over two hundred million in EBITDA, and it's, you know, it's just like a, one of those beautiful successes. This isn't the failure story, is it? No, this is not the failure story. But it's like a great story of like, you know, they wanted to actually take care of the neediest, keep them in their home, and right, right mission, right mentality. And it, it's all working. It's really great and fun to see. Um, and then, you know, the other I'll go back to actually, this is like late 90s and the whole like physician practice management. It was like the first evolution of aggregation of doctors practices, basically, and specialists. And there were two public companies in that area. And we invested in something uh, that was aggregating orthopedic practices. And the idea was you'd make them more efficient. You know, you would have like, you'd, or, you know, you'd help manage their practices. You'd get some leverage with payers. Um, but fundamentally doctors were not the reality was people looked at it as a stock play you know you know it's sort of like the minute the stock prices came down of the companies that were public um then the private companies that were doing it were dead because the doctors would literally like walk out of the no i'm not going to make money on this it's over and you're not and truly we didn't have the information systems to actually help manage their practices better or figure out how you know it's sort of the, the whole value-based theory wasn't working yet. So, I mean, what I learned was certainly in healthcare, one of my first services for is was like never invest in a company in a healthcare company where the motivation of people is economic primarily, right? Like the mission has to be right. You truly have to provide value. The corporate entity was not providing value to these people, the doctors themselves. And then ultimately the mission fell apart. So it just, you know, like that was, I've just never done that again. Um, so you've just got to think about like mission first, then financial second. Yeah, I'm, I'll just be quick. I think, you know, it, th this is definitely the kind of a, a business that will humble you over time. You're never going to be right 100% of the time, the nature of the things that you're trying to do. And, you know, I think from the stories you've heard, most even of your successful companies have pivoted multiple times over the course of it. I sometimes joke, you know, you, we do all our diligence and you get to the first board meeting and you're like, wait, okay, you know, right. I had that on my list, but, you know, also this is a different issue than what we saw before or a different opportunity. So a lot of times it is that person and one of the companies that Andy was talking about has a great founder and uh, I think is also someone who's able to kind of pivot and push through issues. So you're trying uh, to find that. So, you know, you'll have both. And so I think that for the entrepreneurs here, you know, I always try to 
tell them? And is it, so is it like even when a venture fund or someone else passes, you know, on you or goes to this, that doesn't mean that's right. Take the feedback and listen, but does it mean they're right or you're wrong? We're wrong at times too. You know, at times it's just because we're too early. And I always try to wonder, is it better to be totally wrong or just too early? Too early feels maybe a little better, um, <laughs> you know, at times, but there's a lot of learning in this job along the way, which is what makes it really interesting. And when you do it, uh, you know, long enough, I guess you start to have some, you know, pattern recognition, um, but, but everyone is a little bespoke. Yeah, my uh, the fund that I'm running is just four years old, so um, everything's still in process, and we have a pretty fine. We, we, you we haven't have a, exited the companies yet. What, <laughs> what's going on? But I would say that my my observation: one of our um, fastest growing companies is a company that was born out of Mass General Brigham and was started by and funded by physicians who were so fed up with the burden from coding that they um, that they hired developers to help them figure out how they could make their lives better. And uh, that uh, company spun out of Mass General Brigham two years ago now and is growing rapidly and spreading to different health systems. And I think that goes back to really having an intimate understanding of what the workflow problems are of the customer in healthcare and uh, and getting that granularity. And uh, it's tough because I think, as Amy said, each, his, you know, each health system is a little bit of a snowflake and so that does make it a little bit challenging um but uh, so the 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 then next more i would say um lateral way to think about this is that you 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 need to then bring in people who can raise that up and get away from the snowflake and think about things in a more broad how do you attack the general market and for that i would also kind of the, the analogy to that is prior to the fund i'm in now uh, i had the opportunity to work both inside and invest in bioscience companies um, that were trying to use life sciences to um to to address energy needs and biochemical needs. And there it's sort of similar. You can think you have a great um, you have a great discovery, but the sooner that you that you make really good friends or bring on your team a, a really terrific bioprocessing engineer because it's it's never just one thing. It's how well do you assemble the all of the disciplines that you need to actually get to a solution. So when I uh, they they named the comp the fund I'm in the AI Digital Innovation Fund before I got there, but we don't invest in technologies. We invest in solutions, and so it's really important to understand the the granular aspects of the problems that you're trying to solve. Awesome. Well, let's, um, <clears throat> we've held the horses back long enough around AI, uh, but I'm going to tether it to a, to a larger question, which is, I think during COVID, we saw some really massive transformational changes in healthcare. I mean, I've been doing digital health and telehealth for almost 30 years, and I never saw adoption curves like we did during COVID for the virtual delivery of care. And then now I think coming out of COVID, the explosion of uh, generative AI and, and on its coattails, predictive AI, which we had had in place for many years, actually, but the, the power to the computing power and the storage and uh, the ability to uh, deliver those services on platforms that are readily accessible has just um, created huge opportunities. Access to data, health system data, highly curated data is clearly, um, you know, an incredibly important and incredibly well guarded asset. So I wonder, we've seen a bunch of companies retreat from direct to consumer delivery of care, especially with a virtual first approach. So I'm wondering if each of you can talk a little bit about, do you, do you think that, um, the thing that's holding us back or will hold us back with virtual care and, and artificial intelligence delivery is fear of pending regulation, uncertainty of reimbursement? Do you feel like these tools are going to find their way in and uh, and we'll figure those things out later? Um, do you think that we're going to see the same thing with AI that we saw with virtual, which is explosion, massive adoption, and then a retrenching and a moving away? Or do you feel like this is a transformational moment where once in these, these systems will never be decommissioned? They are just going to become part of how we do things and we'll all work for Skynet in the near future. So, uh, so Annie, go ahead. You, I saw her reach for the microphone. Go. 
you, clearly you've thought about this a little I know, bit. I thought, I thought about this a little bit. Yeah, well, first of all, I, I don't think we're retrenching. I think the definition of what virtual care was, I think the reality is, is that in, in almost every model, we're incorporating virtual care, and it never would have happened without COVID, right? I mean, it would happen 10 years later. But so I, I think it's a misnomer to say that digital health, because I think virtualization is happening in all of these solutions and making them better. Um, so I think on that Thank front, you for saying that. I am in charge of virtual care, so I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, I think it's super important. just depends on the business model. I think that on the AI front, I'll you know, let others go on about that. But I think in generative AI, I think the reality is, is there is no holding back. I've never seen so many new companies you know, being created, uh, and there are so many of them using real gen AI. Uh, and I'm excited about it from an administrative and efficiency perspective. I do actually think it's going to be incredibly impactful. I'm seeing it, first of all, we're using it in all of our companies in things like, you know, devoted, uh, you know, just in their call centers. Center, right? They're providing, you know, I, I think 75 people or they've moved to other functions because they've brought Gen AI in and are answering questions better uh, is the reality that, you know, it's very hard to recruit nurses, right? And so leveraging that population and automating, you know, like incredibly valuable. So I think on the in the administrative side, we're looking at a lot of things, which are going to be, you know, I'm sure you're using it, you know, in Epic and ambient notes, you know, and people automatically taking notes, leveraging physician burnout and time, you know, that we're now seeing in different ways where we're using Gen AI tools. So I think there are specific Gen AI companies that are being created that will automatically take notes to diagnosis to then our, you know, rev cycle management. And I think the flow of, uh, the, the the thing that is so caught up and so expensive in terms of getting to rev cycle management uh, and then, you know, getting people paid is actually that piece of it, which is totally not, I mean, it's clinical, but non, not clinical, uh, will be hugely, uh, I think, hugely impacted over the next five years. Um, and so I think that's really important. I think on the clinical side, I've seen one clinical uh, uh, solution right now that's being used. And so I hadn't really thought of this because I do know anytime you, you do not want to threaten a doctor's income, like that is, I've, I've been burned on that front. And so you want to be very careful about that. Um, but we've seen there are three companies competing in the dental space, you know, all sort of created at the same time, all going after each other. I know these companies and it's fascinating because it is basically reading scans, you know, your x-rays and scans in the dentist's office. And, and then it's basically reinforcing. So it's telling the dentist if they missed anything, if there's any like bone decay, you know, you need a bridge, you need a, you know, a cavity, something more serious. Um, and so what's happening is it's actually identifying things the dentist may not have identified, but the dentist appreciates. And two, you know, there's one thing that happens to dentists, people do not like surgery or anything in their mouth. So they say, yes, you've got a problem. And then they go away and they don't come back and fix it until it's a crisis, right? So dentists love it because actually people are more like, like while well, people say that patients don't trust AI, what's ever actually happening in the field is the dentist says it and it's reinforced by the AI and then the patients are much more likely to come back in and take it. So you're actually increasing revenue, but you're also increasing compliance and better care. So I think that is actually a really good clinical application and it's the first one I've seen that's, that is actually being used today. That's great. Now, I would echo Andy's comments on the efficiencies, the administrative piece. I was meeting with a health system CFO, and I think he said it best, which is AI is not going to actually get us better margins, but our margins will be less worse. Um, and so I think that's, it's that resonates in this yeah. room. <laughs> it's compelling for a lot of existing businesses just becoming better businesses. And then as a practicing physician, you know, I can't imagine a time when we didn't have EMRs, right? But try to think back when you're uh, handwriting into the chart. And I'm very confident in five years' time, maybe it's a little sooner, but let's say five years' time, we're going to say, I can't imagine you're writing notes hours a day into the computer. Um, and so I think that's going to 
whether it's for a revenue cycle or patient engagement or freeing up physicians' time, I do think that's going to be very transformational and very exciting. Um, clinician burnout, there's just like a lot of fundamental pieces there. And then I'm not sure how many people will watch South Park here. I'm not a South Park fan, <laughs> but there's a, there's a hilarious video going around on the American health care system from South Park worth checking out. And it's the patient going to insurance, it's the doctor, faxing, emailing the other doctor, and just this whole... Uh, patient navigation is a clerical, administrative, hours and hours long. And as you think about AI as an AI assistant, I think that also is going to start to melt away. Again, let's call it five years time to be safe. But I think those two things, physicians spending hours a day writing notes and, and patients just lost in the space of the healthcare system are going to be fundamentally uh, different with AI, which is, which is exciting. Yeah. And the other thing, I think that there are definitely a lot of what I would call more administrative or like drudgery type work use cases that are out there now, right? Sort of the elimination of that work or the easing of it. And I think that those are the most prevalent now and they are important. I think the question becomes, do they become commoditized somewhat over time or tied into platforms? The part that I think to me is really interesting, but it's out a long time, is that question of so much of the clinical information that we have is unstructured, right? It's notes, it's images, et cetera. So how you start to think about the ability to automate the reading and understanding of that information is really interesting. I think part of it starts by informing physicians, what are patients like mine doing in these cases or what do, how do I think about this and aiding them? That I think also has a likelihood of being connected into platforms like Epic and others. The one place that's on my mind and, and Andy made a comment about the consumer, which I agree with. And when I bring this up with my partners, I always say, how will you make money? And I, I don't know. Um, and that, that's sometimes not a good thing in, in venture. But I would say um, one of the things that I do think ultimately happens is the patient is going to be fed a lot of information in the future, right? They're going to have just structured and unstructured data, and they're taking care of their parents or their kids, and they're trying to make sense of this information, which right now they call everybody in the world. They try to find somebody else they can talk to. Then that doctor says, well, was it this or that? And they're like, I don't know. How old are they? They're like, I think they're about 80. I don't know. So there's a lot that you can't answer when you're starting to do that work. Somebody's going to get in the middle of that and I think create a platform for the patient. And the reason I say that is if you say, where do you go to when you think about buying something today? A lot of people would say Amazon. There was a time when Google would have never believed that product searches would start on Amazon, that Walmart would never have believed that product searches would start on Amazon. If I say to you, where do you think about entertainment? You want to watch a lot of people say Netflix. If I say you got to get somewhere, what do you think of? A lot of people say Uber. If I say you need to manage your health, where do you go? Nobody has an answer. Nobody owns that space. Your, your uncle, the doctor. <laughs> right. Nobody has that space. So somebody that we don't know is probably going to own that space, and they're going to own that space through AI. And that's a platform that you can monetize over time if you can own that space and be funded sufficiently to do it. So I'm not sure there's a business there. If I inspire any one of you to look for one, if you happen to find it, come find me. Um, uh, but uh, you know that to me is the sort of future uh, of some of this, and it may bring the patient closer. Yeah, I'll just build on that. I mean, I don't have a business model for this either, but when I look forward, you know, there are two, there are two trends here that are sort of inexorable. One is the aging of the demographics of the population. Um, it, it is, uh, it, and then the second one has just escaped my mind. But anyway, um, <laughs> the, when you, oh, the other is that you're scared, you're, you're run, you know, there is a shortage of, clinicians and of trained clinicians pick your specialty, right? And so we are going to need to find tools that will allow us to leverage those clinicians and we are going to find need to find tools and businesses that help us not just manage to really manage our own health. I think if you sort of look at the arithmetic of clinicians to people as you, and then the intensity of the care required as you get older, there's going to be more of a responsibility placed on the individual to care to figure out how to um, care for themselves and care for their loved ones. And so I think that there is this, and I think that's where AI can really play an important role going forward. Um, so that's where I see an opportunity, but I'm like you, I don't yet have the business model to support it. I do think the other elephant in the room is our payment model, because a lot of the things that AI can do on the diagnostics side are here. 
there's over 300 um, algorithms that have been approved, uh, FDA cleared, but they're not in the market in the U.S. because you need to have it for every FDA clearance, and then you need to have a, a, a way to get paid for using that diagnostic. And you know the the number that have been cleared far outstrips the number that are paid for. So if we shift to more of a value based or at risk payment structure, then you, it tilts the um, incentive to use diagnostics intelligently to try and prevent care or to target care. So I think that's sort of, in my mind, the elephant in the room that's going to hold back some of the exciting AI um, developments that are here and now, but we're not taking advantage of. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting, that's the, the, the one of the last implementation barriers, right? You do all that work, you build a product, you get it FDA approved if it's not a really, you know, like a back office solution, and then you got to figure out how to get it reimbursed. Interestingly, I, I read an article I think it was in the Wall Street Journal a couple of months ago about mammography centers that are now offering AI enhanced reading of the mammogram in a self pay model because it's not covered by insurance. And the, the pitch to the women is, well, you could get this overread by this amazing algorithm and it has a much greater likelihood of correctly diagnosing if that abnormality is really a cancer, saving you a biopsy, whatever, all these amazing things, but it'll cost you $300. You know, do you want to, do you want that? which I think, you know, raises some issues around health equity. And so I want to maybe, uh, for our last uh, big question, we've been talking largely, I think, about the U.S. market. I mean, we haven't really said that explicitly, but it feels like that from the way we've been talking about payment models. And in the U.S., for many people, not for everyone, but for many people, you know, it, it is Dr. Famous plus AI or just Dr. Famous, right? You, you know, you have an opportunity to see an expert, and its question is how much marginal uh, gain will they have by having an AI tool to support them? But in many countries, it's AI enhanced service versus either nothing or a much more, uh, a, a lesser trained, more generalist uh, availability. So do you think about opportunities in international markets where AI may be a standalone diagnostic product, for example, or where your payer might be, you know, a, a single government payer, not, you know, 15 different private payers? Or is this like no man's land, quicksand, stay away at all costs? Or is there a, you know, is there a component to the kinds of companies you think about funding that have more of a, you know, a mission oriented approach where the margin may not reach the returns that you're looking for, but you think there's an important need to be met? I'd say, I'd say for me, the U.S. healthcare system's complicated enough mm -hmm. and also big enough, right? I don't know, five trillion trillion dollar economy, so it's a, a big enough pool to be swimming in. Uh, the one area we will look internationally is on the life sciences side because you know, drugs are distributed uh, throughout the world, and so when you think about clinical trials and clinical trial software, that has more of a, a natural global footprint than U.S. centric. But by and large, we're we're quite focused here in the U.S. Yeah, I would say, you know, similarly, right, you, you know, in the U.S., I think, uh, you know, one of the things that is complex about it is, you know, we call it a healthcare system. And I think people make that people think that it was like put together, you know, deliberately, and then they're upset that it doesn't work a certain way. But it's it's but it is honestly just a set of actions, unintended consequences, reactions that has devolved itself into a set of competing economic models and so like how you fit into that is is really complicated and i think if you add an international again same thing it's more it it is another complexity we have looked at some things coming across that's hard i would say the only other thing about international having looked at it in prior lives from a broader lens of like what do you think works internationally generally speaking it's to your the point earlier far things you're going to sell if you're going to sell something and you're manufacturing something you should sell it everywhere mm -hmm. if you can so manufacturing or companies like that pharma will obviously Obviously, be international, and the other is when you have really great lift and shift models, meaning you do the same thing in different markets. Like if you're IKEA, for example, you can do the same thing here, and you can do the same thing here. That's great. We always thought, like for example, when I was in CVS, around international and pharmacy, is the things you've learned here don't necessarily apply to what you'll have to do there, mm -hmm. so you don't get as much leverage around that. And I think that's still true in healthcare. So it's hard to have sufficient expertise to be fully international without a bigger I think fund and structure would be my my point. But we are watching what's developing that could come here, and we're certainly open to that, and we've had a few successes with that. Yeah, you want to? I mean, we 
are required to have a U.S. presence to make an investment. That said, we do work with startups that come from overseas that you know may have grown up in a single uh, single payer system and are coming to be partners or looking to partner or to pilot at Mass General Brigham. And I think we're and so that's sort of where we are most internationally focused. And I'd say with that, it's really translation, right, of what. What additional data do you now need to generate to um, to get paid for your service or your device or your diagnostic here in this ecosystem? And it's a lot of like understanding, okay, you have that data, but that data is not going to speak to CVS when they look at whether or not they want to pay for the for the product. So we help uh, co-develop on that end. All right, we're, we're almost out of time. I'm going to start with Brenton and go back this way. Uh, name the product or the sector that you are like dog on a bone trying to find a company in right now. Like what is that magic space that you just know there's got to be a company out there to solve that problem and you want in? I'll give you a few because there might be some folks out there. <laughs> yeah. um, specialty value-based care is one we've been very active in. Mm -hmm. Um psychedelics and the fertility are just very fast growing areas. And then um, to the point comments made earlier, Medicaid uh, innovation in general is uh, an area of, of great interest. And probably not one company that does all three of those. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would I would mimic most of those actually. Uh, we are focused on just value based care in general, especially you know, definitely good. Um, but honestly, it's, it's interesting. I, you know, I, 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 we're, we are focused on all the different ways one could use gen AI and new business models. And it, we're kind of like, okay, entrepreneurs, it's really up to you. Like we do create about 20% of what we do, but what I love is we know the whole health care system. We're interested, but it's the comp you know, it, it's the entrepreneur that comes to us who's like, oh, that is novel. That's new. Like, we're not the entrepreneur, you know, like you all are. So, and I think we respect you know, like our role and your role in this ecosystem, and we help you then make it, a, you know, your dream kind of successful. That's our job. Um, but we're, I would say, we generate about twenty percent of the ideas and then create them ourselves. Yep. Um, you know, obviously, those I think were were a great opportunities. Place I'm spending probably most of my time right now, I would call it in the specialty pharmacy space. Um, and it's not really sort of in drug discovery, but it's everything from access to commercialization. I think when you look at the therapies that are coming to market, they're really game changing therapies in terms of their effect on human health, a lot more than many of the other things that we talk about in forums like this. But I think they create a tremendous amount of complexity for the system around access, around new models of getting those types of products to patients. And then the pay for is all ultimately really complicated and leading to what I think is an affordability crisis in this country. And so how you remake the insurance system and think about how you pay for therapies that are really sort of life-changing therapies, but have really high costs. The average specialty pharmacy drug came to market with a $300,000 price tag last year. That's driven by some in a million, two million. The pipeline is 21 cell and gene therapies on market, a thousand coming. The system really isn't ready for how to manage that. And if you're sitting inside of a health system, the other problem you have is it's going to shift where you make money because procedures are going to change, right? Therapies are going to become more important. So this is one of the big cyclical changes coming in healthcare. And so that's an area where I'm spending most of my time in terms of where I'm looking for investments. Look forward to hearing about that, Josh. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I think that's I, I totally agree that that that, that trend is um, super important. So um we follow the what's strategically important in the health system. So we have a major initiative on building up our healthcare at home or home hospital program. We're looking to by 2025 have 10% of our beds be at home. And so, uh, you know, we have a big partnership with Best Buy, but we, we, that is just the core. And then we're sure that there will be white space around that. So we're, um, looking at companies that can help, um, uh, 
you know, help make that a reality. We're also trying to grow our health plan, trying to lean into our population health um, efforts to because we are taking an ever increasing amount of risk. We just recently, I guess a year ago, took on 300,000 Medicaid lives. So we really follow sort of the strategic initiatives. Another one that's just spinning up and I'm interested to follow is we're trying to think of how do we support our researchers more effectively from a digital perspective. We've, that's been a pretty ad hoc space, even though we have a $2.3 billion research organization at Mass General Brigham. So you wouldn't have thought it was ad hoc, but it's been ad hoc. So trying to think about, you know, how can you take advantage of different tools to address that? Well, please join me in thanking this panel for a wonderful conversation. Thank you.